Quite possibly one of the most iconic scouting activities outside of camping and hiking is canoeing. And canoes are found all over the world with their origins going back thousands of years. For example, the oldest known canoe was found in 1955 by a farmer in the Netherlands while digging up part of his land for a new road. Now this canoe has been carbon dated back to between 8040 and 7510 BC. While this is the oldest canoe we know of, experts believe it is by no means the first canoe ever built by mankind. We're going to learn more about the history of the canoe and even hear the story of a canoe built from the plans found in an old issue of Boys Life magazine in this edition of Artifact of the Week. Found all over the world, the word canoe has its origins in the Arawakan languages of the Caribbean. Kanawa and Kinu, both meaning dugout. These words were adopted by the Spanish and Portuguese and spread throughout the world to describe a wide variety of seaworthy vessels. While the earliest known example of a canoe was the dugout found in the Netherlands, 8,000-year-old canoes have been discovered in China and Nigeria, and a 7,000-year-old reed boat was found in Kuwait. Additionally, a wide variety of prehistoric boats have been discovered throughout the Americas. The earliest canoes were dug out of a single large tree using tools made of animal bones and stones. Dugouts were also made by burning out the middle of a tree, which caused the sap to crystallize and help seal and waterproof the canoe, as well as protect it from insects. The Chumash people, a Native American community based out of what is now Southern California, begin constructing plank canoes by sewing together planks of redwood with fibers made from twisted milkweed. The awl holes were reinforced with heated asphaltum mixed with pine pitch. These plank canoes took hundreds of man hours to construct and were decorated with shells and precious stones, which reflected a family's wealth and status. Plank canoes allowed sailors to venture further into the ocean where they could hunt very large fish, such as the swordfish, which became a staple of the Chumash society. In Africa, it's documented that canoes were so large they could carry more than a hundred soldiers, or in some cases an entire community, with multiple cooking fires burning on the canoes that did not impact the canoe's seaworthiness. These canoes were found on slow-moving rivers and large lakes throughout the continent. Polynesian people spread throughout the Pacific Ocean, even reaching the west coast of the Americas on large ocean-going canoes fitted with outriggers and sails to increase their speed and maintain stability. By sailing in groups that allowed these seafaring people to bring enough supplies and people along to travel thousands of miles over the open ocean. In North America, most of the canoe designs used a technique where the bark of a tree, usually a birch bark, was stretched over a wooden frame to form the canoe. This made them very lightweight, sturdy, and agile. Lewis and Clark noted that these characteristics made it very easy to navigate treacherous water features with canoes, as you could simply pull them out of the water and carry them on your shoulder to less formidable territory. Canoes were vital to the westward expansion across North America and formed much of the logistics tale that supported migration and trade. While the birch bark canoe is still in use today, later advancements saw tanned animal skins used to cover the frame, making the canoe very easy to repair if it became damaged. By the 19th century, canvas was used to stretch over the wooden frame and then coated with varnishes and paints to make it more durable and watertight. Eventually, fiberglass and plastics were used to make canoes that were fabricated around molds. And by the end of World War II, canoes were also being made out of aluminum. Well, this made them much more durable, but it also made them heavier than other materials. One of the drawbacks to fiberglass, plastic, and aluminum canoes was their high cost. In the 1950s, a commercially produced canoe could cost anywhere from $150 to $200. Today, these same canoes retail for $1,300 to $2,500. To help scouts out, Boys Life published articles and plans for how to make your own camping and outdoor gear. One of these do-it-yourself projects was a canoe made from orange crates. In the January 1951 issue of Boys Life magazine, there were instructions to help and guide scouts in the construction of an orange crate canoe. Orange crates were very common in the early 1950s, so the cost for a scout was greatly reduced if he could find someone to give him these used crates. In 1956, orange crates were beginning to become less common, so the plans were modified and published again in Boy's Life. In the 1960s, Boy's Life started to produce a series of booklets called the Reprint Series. 
One of these reprints, titled Boats and Canoes, had a reprint of the 1956 Orange Crate Canoe Project. Two older scouts in Louisville, Kentucky, Michael Finfer and Lewis Rowe, were looking for a project to take on that would build on some of the skills and interests they already had, be challenging enough to make fun, and in this case, help them acquire something they couldn't afford to just go out and buy. So they decided to build an Orange Crate canoe. We said, well, I think that would be a great project. So we embarked upon that uh, project in the basement of my house in Louisville, Kentucky. We uh, were regular uh, visitors to the local fruit store and they were very accommodating. They saved us all their wooden orange crates and um, grapefruit crates and we would come once a week and pick them all up, take them apart, and according to the plans we would uh, we made a frame and then we used the actual orange crate wood to make the slats that you see uh, on the um, canoe itself. It took us about two years to complete the project. Um, we moved from our basement uh, from the winter months into the garage to complete the project. Once we had the outer shell on using the orange crate wood, then we covered it with canvas, filled it uh, with some special uh, paint filler, and then in spots we fiberglassed it and then completed the rest of the painting. I asked Michael what the hardest part of the process was. I think the, the hardest part was getting uh, the, the crate panels to bend without cracking. So some of the places, especially in the front and the rear, they are twisted at somewhat of acute angles uh, to give it the shape of a normal canoe, the sleek, streamlined shape. And we had to be very careful. We, obviously, it was a trial and error, and um, we, we had enough orange crates that we could experiment a little bit, but we eventually figured out how to do it very slowly, using some steam, bend it a little bit more, and uh, slowly give it the shape and sculpture that it finally had. Once the canoe was complete, it was time to put it in the water and christen their new vessel. It was a big event, and the media was invited to cover the story as well. Uh, the canoe was launched by Lewis's sister, who was uh, a few years younger than us, using a, a bottle of uh, Fall City beer, which was the local brewing company at the time. And uh, we christened it Aquarius after a popular song of the time, and also the meaning means water carrier. It just seemed like a good name. We uh, notified the news media. They came out and the local news media did a, a story uh, with a video of us launching the canoe at Cox's Park in Louisville uh, on the Ohio River. Uh, the print media also came out, did a story on us. Now that they knew the canoe was seaworthy, the real adventures began. Then after we completed the launch day, we took it to uh, Rough River, Kentucky to give it a, a test run in uh, Rough River. Everything worked out well. Uh, then we figured it would be safe to go on some more rapid water. We took it on several streams in Kentucky, the Green River, the Salt River, the Rock Castle River, um, and then we took it up to Canada. And I can't tell you the name of the river. That It was a pretty wild river. Uh, way up in, in Canada, and uh, then the next year we took it on a few more trips. And after a few years, we entered our professional training, and it was sitting in a storage locker for the last 40 years. Louis was an avid photographer and shot a lot of film footage of their adventures, including their 1965 film on Trek. To secure his camera and other valuables, they outfitted the canoe with two ammo cans from a near nearby military base to serve as waterproof containers. They also added a first aid kit. Needed some place secure to make sure that it was watertight. So we added uh, these ammo boxes. Um, we grew up near Fort Knox and things like this were readily available. So that's what we decided to use. We strapped them securely into the frame of the canoe. And we did turn over multiple times during the course of our journeys and uh, we never lost anything. We kept our wallets in there and any valuables and uh, that protected that. And we also have this first aid and survival kit that we attached to the canoe because uh, we never knew 
what, when we might need that. We figured that maybe there would be a need to rescue somebody who fell overboard, so I can't remember exactly where we got that boat ring, but we uh, sort of personalized that as part of the, the canoe equipment. In the summer of 2021, Paul Cronin, a friend of Michael and Louie's going back to their Boy Scout days in Louisville, served as a docent here at the National Scouting Museum and asked if the museum would be interested in having something like this donated to the collection. We agreed, and Michael and Paul delivered the canoe from Louisville just a couple of weeks ago. Well, we did talk about it, and we were both um, very anxious to see if, if it was a good fit for your museum. We took it out of storage, hosed it off, didn't really need a lot more done to it. It was safely stored for 40 years, and other than an accumulation of, of dust, um, it was just like the day we put it in the storage bin after our last excursion, so. By the way, Michael told me their out-of-pocket expense to build the Orange Crate Canoe was about $20 each. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Join us next time as we continue to learn more about the history of the Boy Scouts of America through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week. <laughs>